Well, good afternoon. Welcome, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, dear colleagues, to the OSC Development Lecture number 19 um, on the topic of global water scarcity and the need for a sustainable approach to water management. Um, well, it is my pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, you all to this, um, from my point of view at least, a very timely um, debate on water management. Um, as you all know, driven by the climate crisis and other factors, water scarcity is rapidly becoming a um, global problem um, that is affecting large, a large number of, of countries, particularly in the global south, uh, perhaps against the background of a rather favorable and privileged uh, situation in Austria. Um, this is not perceived by many in the Austrian public as such a pressing problem, but um, indeed it is, and um, it will certainly become uh, an area of principal concern for um, international politics um, in the foreseeable future, um, given that uh, water management in urban areas, but also in rural areas, uh, might arguably, arguably become uh, more um, conflictive um, in the future, um, given rivaling and competing claims um, on water resources. Um, so um, we thought it is, um, as I already said, a very timely um, uh, issue that we should address also from the perspective of both uh, development studies, development research and uh, development cooperation. So it is my pleasure to, um, to, have, uh, to, 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 to welcome uh, Professor Stephen Gorelick from Stanford University uh, as the keynote speaker today. Um, it is particularly a pleasure given that uh, Steve is um, directing um, a, an international consortium project, which is called Food, Water, Energy for, Sust for Urban Sustainable Environments, FUSE, um, in which he's also collaborating with, with EFSA um, and, and also other institutions, in particular the um, UFZ Leipzig and, um, and YASA here uh, near Vienna. Um, so it is um, a, a great pleasure to cooperate with you. Um, and um, I'm also very happy that uh, our principal researcher in, in that project, Karin Kübelberg, uh, Kübelberg will um, chair um, and facilitate today's discussion. Um, and also um, our second uh, principal researcher from Öfste, uh, uh, who's participating in the FUSE project, uh, Ines Oman, Oman, will also uh, join us um, in today's meeting and participate in the um, um, discussion later on. So uh, with that, I thank, thank you all again. I also want to thank the um, two commentators, uh, Mr. Wolfgang Gruber from the City of Vienna and Mrs. Teresa Schütz from Austrian Hello. Development Agency for joining us in this discussion. And I'm looking forward to a very interesting uh, meeting and to a lively debate. So thank you very much. And uh, I hand over to Karin. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is this working now? Is it loud enough? Okay, great, because I heard that my microphone today is not ideal, so I'll make an effort, but please, please let me know when you can't hear me. So good afternoon from my side. I'm very happy um, to moderate this discussion this afternoon um, about this important topic. We will, um, as Werner Ratzer said, first hear a keynote by Professor Gorelik from Stanford University, and then two comments uh, from the Austrian Development Corporation, Teresa Schütz, and Wolfgang Gruber from the City of Vienna. Um, maybe before we start, a few words about our, our institute for those who don't know us. Um, the Austrian Foundation for Development Research is a research institute working on global policy issues such as international development policy, global value chains, trade and natural resource policies and stakeholder participation. And uh, together with two other organizations, we have a public library on development topics. Um, and um, yeah, and if you're interested in staying informed about our work uh, with a monthly newsletter, I wanted to say that you can sub subscribe to. Um, as Werner Ratz has already stated, the access to water is a major challenge in many countries. And this problem is exacerbated with climate change um, also in the future. Professor Gorelik is one of the world leading experts in freshwater management in the focuses also on long-term impacts and long-term policies for securing water supply. He has carried out policy-oriented research in different regions, such as India, Vietnam, Jordan, Mexico, or California, where he's professor in the School of Earth, Energy and Environmental Sciences, and is a senior fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford University. Professor Gorelick runs the Hydro Program and directs the Global Freshwater Initiative, 
He has authored several books and published over 150 papers, including in science and nature. He's a member of the US National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And um, yeah, we have been working together in the FUSE project um, since 2018, which um, Professor Goredic will also talk about in his keynote. And um, yeah, we are very happy to have you, Steve, and uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Karen. I, let me um, get my screen going and get this big. Okay, is that big? Can you see? Uh, it is. It is still not in presentation mode. It's not in presentation mode. Uh, let me try it again. Yes. That's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I'm tempted to say that my my father would have liked it. My mother would have believed it. So. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing and just give a general background to the this topic. Uh, I have a lot, so I'm going to go a little fast, maybe, but hopefully not too fast. Um, so just on the global water fact situation, less than 0.3% of the world's water is usable for people and irrigated agriculture. And you should note that irrigated agriculture is only 20% of cultivated agricultural land. So there's a lot of potential for more irrigation, even if irrigation gets more efficient. Um, world water use has increased at twice the rate of global population growth, and one in six people lack access to, to safe water. I want to go through some definitions um, that are relevant to this discussion, particularly in areas that I've been working in, which are, are water scarce or have severe water problems and are um, in largely developing nations. Uh, one is, is the concept of unsustainability. So you, in my view, you can never really tell if a system is, water system is sustainable. You can only tell if it's unsustainable and you can make, you can surmise that it might be sustainable in some way. Um, so this is a set of axes that show human well-being versus time. And, and what happens to the trend of a resource. And the water resource is what we're gonna talk about here, but other resources and food and energy can also have the same paradigm. And so, you know, metrics of well being could be income, could be water use, could be duration of water use, reliability of water use, that kind of thing. Um, unsustainable means that it's basically a bathtub type aquifer or a lake where, or some kind of system where it's a finite amount of water and that water is, is being used and it's being depleted. It could be soils that are becoming salinated and they're not gonna be useful anymore. Vulnerability on the other hand has to do with, there's a certain threshold of, of, of well-being that you wanna maintain, but seasonally or otherwise, you can find that there's a drought and, and well-being suffers, people suffer, but that then can recover, but that suffering period is something you wanna avoid as a society. And then you have chronic scarcity where even if the level of resources is increasing, you know, it may not go straight up, but it's increasing, you never reach a, a level that is a, an acceptable level of human well being. So, in talking about water specifically, uh, you can look at this globally and say we have precipitation minus evaporative demand, which means that's the water that is potentially useful to you that plants and the sun are not pulling back up into the atmosphere. Uh, if you look at the, 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 the brownish red and, and um, beige colors, these colors, you'll see that there's many places where we're in deficit. This is minus um, this value. So this is precipitation minus evaporation demand and it's minus 1,000, so uh, millimeters or uh, a meter of water and this is zero to 1,000. So you can see that going from west to east, we have a lot of the US um, is in terrible deficit now. You'll read about it in the newspapers to come and it's really, really a, the worst situation they've had in California since reservoirs were built or major reservoirs were built. Um, Northern Africa, we work in the Middle East. Um, India is, is, has this issue. I've spent about a year and a half of my life in, in, in Australia where this is a big problem. And even in, in South Asia and in Southern Asia, 
um, there are areas that are having this difficulty. So that's this global situation. Just to give you an example of unsustainability, this is the Punjab. We're going to be talking about India a bit. So the Punjab is this area in northern um, India, and it's the breadbasket for, for, for India. It um, occupies a very small percent of the land area of India, but it yet grows 21% uh, um, of the wheat. You can see those statistics, cotton and rice. And this is an area where wells became really inexpensive. The technology for well development got, was very inexpensive. Wells were drilled, deep, deep wells, tube wells were drilled uh, and electricity was basically free. And so what happened was there was major groundwater depletion. To show you the magnitude of groundwater depletion, if you look at, at satellite data, there's one satellite called the GRACE um, satellite system which measures the gravitational pull of the earth and so the earth's gravitational field was affected by how much water was de was depleted in this area so it weighs less and you can see that from outer space and so that's clearly a major depletion there are certain spots in the rest of the planet where you can see this kind of major depletion of water resources and that's not sustainable the other issue in the world is that um, global population is increasing. It's maybe thought that around 2070 or a little bit later that the world's population will, will start to, to top out and decline. But um, what we have here is that you have population increasing, but the cumulative reservoir volume is this line here, and, and it's stabilizing. There's not that many more places to, to store water on the surface. Uh, and if there are, a lot of the old ones are getting filled in with sediment and becoming silted out. And so you lose uh, volume. And so this is, um, you know, an example of scarcity where you just don't, you may not reach a level that you need to store surface water any longer. We're stuck with what we have and those are depreciating and declining um, in, in terms of their value for, for water resources. Um, where does the water go? Uh, the short answer is it goes to agriculture. 70% uh, of the world's water is, is used by agriculture. And you can see the domestic and, and, and industry um, water is also used. But what's striking here is that there's two lines on each of these graphs. There's the, the one on the, on the right, which is the, the water consumed. And that means water that's taken out of commission. You can't use it for anything else. It's in the case of agriculture, it goes into the plants themselves, but, but mostly it goes into the atmosphere through transpiration of the plants. And then you have you know, domestic use where there's water that is no longer useful. Um, it's so contaminated, for example, or it goes into septic tanks and, it's, and um, it may not be usable in the future. And then you have industry with the same problem. But the big issue is the consumptive use of water by agriculture. Okay, and so that's the big one that's shown here is this this, this, this line is what, what's, um, what's taken out. And this is what's actually cons consumed. Okay, so I wanna give a story about, we've been, about an area we worked in in Chennai. Um, it's shown here on the south uh, east side of, um, of India. We worked there for about seven years and it's a coastal city right now. It has about 11 million people. It's in the state of Tamil Nadu. Um, and I should point out that India doesn't have any major city with a 24 seven water supply system. These are my, this was my former student and postdoc, Venus Srinivasan, who's now at an NGO in India. She moved back to India. And then this is Larry Gulder, who is a colleague of mine. He was chair of the economics department who I had a good collaboration with on this project. So what's it like there? Um, we happened to hit this region in a study in an area where the um, climate was the, the weather was changing. I don't know if I'll go as far as climate, but the, the, we had one of the driest periods on record and the wettest year that they've ever seen in the study period. So that was m magnificent. Um, we did we had access to household surveys of water use before and then and after or you know during this during this period, and so we had really good data. Uh, and so the wet season is, it's a monsoonal climate. It, it's fed by the Northeast monsoon. 
and the wet period is from October to December and the water levels for groundwater in January are, are, um, um, are, are high and then lowest in July. And so that's what we're working with. We have this contrast and we're gonna focus on this, on this drought over here. Um, they grow crops in the region, but it's a, an urbanizing area that's taking over the farmland. And you'll see that in some pictures I'm gonna show in a bit. So this is Chennai and where do they get their water from? So they get 77% um, of their water from these reservoirs. So they have surface water reservoirs and they have some well fields, okay? And then there's tanker trucks and back then, there was only 2% of the public utility uh, had access to tanker trucks that fed mostly the slum areas. And everybody else was reliant on standpipes or having water that was um, provided to them through some other ne uh, pipe network system, but intermittent. And then the rest was groundwater. And you can see that um, there's 420,000 uh, wells back then in this in this region. Now, to put that in perspective, if you have an, a European football field, there you would find seven wells in that, that area. So you, you, there was wells everywhere. Then why would anybody, why would people have so many wells? Because the supply system is so intermittent that anybody who could afford a well would have a well because you wanted to have access to water. And so this was their insurance policy. So the problem that we faced was that in 2003 uh, and four, Chennai suffered from this enormous water crisis. Um, the, the reservoirs dried up, the pump uh, pipe supply shut down for a year, basically. Um, private wells went dry in many of the areas of the city and the entire city was supplied by these tanker trucks. And the tanker trucks, you can see as far as your eye could see, there would be tanker trucks. Now, those were not government tanker trucks. Those were just entrepreneurial people who said, I can get water from farming areas and, and, get, and fill my tanker truck and deliver it to people for their supply. So the question is, you know, do we, what happened then and can we avoid it in the future? The way folks get water there, a good portion of the, of the folks who, who don't have access in their household a third of the of the households didn't have um, indoor plumbing even, uh, is through largely the women and children carrying these pots, these heavy pots of water that have 15 liters of water. And their per capita water use is not too bad that way. It's 100 liters per, per day. Putting it in perspective, I understand that the water use in um, per capita is about 130 in, in, in Vienna. So it's not, it's not bad if everything goes well and that's in a, in a good year. It didn't happen that way all the time and certainly not in the drought where they got this much water. And there's an example of people walking to this water uh, tanker truck. And then there was this, there, folks who would pump this water from a standpipe, the pipe network is not under pressure. I mean, it's like an underground little river in the pipe. So you have to pump the water out of the pipe and pump it into these pots. And this fellow would put it on his bicycle and take it and deliver it for some feet. Okay, the utility. Um, the pipe water supply was about five uh, cents per kiloliter. Um, you know, if you have a household of three or four people at 100 liters per capita, then, you know, this is a couple of days of water supply for this much water. And what you see here is that the pipe water supply is about five cents per kiloliter in US dollars, which is still quite, kind of cheap. And that's 85% subsidized. Okay, so that's the reason it's so low. This is to get everybody a basic water supply. And then there's some private wells. Okay, and that's the cost of is about 50 cents. And what the city has done and has continued to do since we finished the study is to build these desalination plants. And that's a very expensive so source of water. It's environmentally destructive, but it also is quite expensive. And then you have tanker waters, which is even worse. And, um, and those are taking over in these areas. And it's not just in India, that's happening elsewhere where there's um, water disasters and the tanker truck water is becoming very expensive. Putting these numbers in perspective you might say, well, that's not very much money. Just bear in mind that GDP per capita in Austria is 50,000 US dollars. And just the proportion matters here is 9,000 in Chennai. And Chennai is a fairly rich city. So the question we have is, what are the policies that might be effective in preventing a recurrence of such a crisis? Um, for example, you can have new desalination plants, you can expand reservoirs, um, and you can have rainwater harvesting, which I'll talk about. Desalination, they're doing. It's very expensive. And it's, uh, as I said, it's not 
the greatest solution, but it is fairly secure in terms of supplying water. It's just incredibly expensive and it's environmentally damaging. Expanding the reservoirs is really impossible to do because people live where you might want to put reservoirs and in India, you can't get them to, to move. I've done some work in China and China can say move and people move, but not in India. So we're talking about rainwater harvesting. Now, rainwater harvesting has different definitions and different qualities technically at different, in different locations. In this part of India, we're talking about rooftop rainwater harvesting. And what the idea is, is that you have a rooftop and then you have a pipe that collects the water and you don't drink that water. You put that water in the ground, okay? And that water recharges the aquifer and then you can pump out that water um, later on and use it for, for non-potable supply, okay? You can't count on its quality, but a lot of use can be offset uh, for fresh water by pumping out this groundwater that you recharged. So you have an artificial recharge system that's done by locally, everybody having this rainwater harvesting method. And what I wanna show you here is a really cool video that was put forth by the Center for Science and Environment. And they actually won the Stockholm Water Prize some years back um, for promoting rainwater harvesting. Um, so this is their promotional video. Oops, can you hear this? K Karen, can you hear this? No. No, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go out and mm, I think it was all in the stopping and sharing and sharing. Sharing, sorry, I have to go back. Okay, you should see my share again. Yes. Can you hear it now? Yes. So um, you can hear me again, right? Yes. Okay, good. So this was um, this promotional video. It says rainwater belongs to all of us, but how to keep and share. And it was a, it was a populist movement that people wanted. They mandated that you had to, um, to install, have rainwater, uh, rooftop rainwater harvesting on all new buildings. And so this was a good program. It just wasn't beneficial to the public utilities because they don't get money for selling water. So they weren't terribly supportive of this. I, I think this rainwater harvesting has taken over since our study I know, in a big way. Now you have different ways of thinking about water. If you have a centralized water supply system, you have reservoirs, you have groundwater, you have a public utility. The public utility then collects that water and distributes it to a household. In India that you can pump water from a standpipe, you can have a sump which is a, a big tank underground and that can store about one kiloliter. So some days of supply and then water is pushed up to the, the surface by some kind of a pump. And then there's a tank on your roof and that goes into the household and that feeds the kitchen. That feeds the, the water that you drink and touches food and your hands and stuff. So um, that is your source of, of um, really fresh water and all water is boiled in any, in any case. This is, this is a, a, a dash line for two reasons. One, the supply is intermittent, and two, you have, a, you have pipe leaks. And in India, the pipe leaks are in this region about 25%, and um, there's an effort to maybe reduce those, but getting it you know, to half of that would be a challenge. Okay, so how does it really work? People have their own wells, as we saw, and there's private tanker trucks, and those are not part of the public system. How big is this? 23 to 66% 
of the total water consumed in Chennai comes from this um, cons from wells and from tanker trucks. So this is not part of the public utility system and it's their way of coping with their lack of water. If you have a conceptual model, and I'm not gonna get into too many quantitative things here on, the, on this side, but if you, we develop computer models that help analyze policies and policy interventions uh, to see if they're gonna work and what, what they, how, how effective they might be. So you have surface water and you have groundwater and those are your supplies and they go to some public agency for urban and for agriculture. And then you have the water users, which are farmers and then urban and industrial water users, non-farmers. And then you can see, okay, what's the effect on ecosystem health um, in, a, in a groundwater that may be, be, de be depleted and that could dry up rivers or take water from rivers. Uh, for example, you have consumer benefit, you have consumer surplus, you have producer benefits. And so then you can say in your model, well, what happens if we add a water market or a food market? How does this then affect these metrics? Okay, so you introduce these in the model and then you see their impacts on various metrics. And we have many metrics we can look at. Okay, so we develop an integrated model. This is just schematic. We have models of the rainfall runoff, how the reservoirs fill, how the reservoirs are operated. We have the groundwater system. We can see what the effect of pumping is and what the effect of recharge is. We model the utility and its distribution system, the tanker market, and all the consumer supply and demand across many different categories of consumers by socioeconomic class, by their accessibility to, to, um, to water in their households. And then from this, we get the water consumed by every source and we get things like consumer surplus and we get other measures of how much water per capita you get when you implement a certain strategy for managing the utility system and seeing how the tanker market might even respond. This, is, this comes about organically because there's not enough water. So what's the utility-based solutions? You can have reservoirs and, and um, you can have desalination plants. They can't increase their reservoir capacity. And at the time we did this, they were gonna put a second desal plant in. And then you can improve efficiency. You can reduce pipe leaks from 25 to 12%. And you can double the price on the wealthy consumers. So this transitional solution, it's not a permanent solution, is rainwater harvesting. And what we, what we found was you can raise the tariffs on the rich people, on the people who use the water and can afford to have their tariffs raised. You can fix the pipe network, meaning you reduce the leaks from 25 to 12%. And you go with rainwater, rainwater harvesting, groundwater um, harvesting for, um, for non-potable uses. And what we found when we did a cost benefit analysis is the costs are such and the, and the um, benefits are such that this is a win situation. And so it was a valuable thing to get you through some number of years. Okay, so what might urbanization do to this if we wanna look at the future? And so what we did was we considered, okay, they build the two desalination plants, which they did. And then you have population growth and you have urbanization. Plus you have another drought, the magnitude of the drought they saw already. So let's go back to 1988. And this is like the dark area is 10,000 people per square kilometer. And then we, we get down to you know, smaller numbers. The average density in, in Vienna is something like 4,600 people per square kilometer. So this is population density. This is agriculture area. And you'll see these colors, meaning that we can see where the corridors are for urban development. This is the population shown here. So in 2020, I think in the year 2000, 23%, this is urban agglomeration is spreading. We get up to 6 million. We get to 2010 when we did our study and one third is urbanized by then or about one third. And you can see this growing. It's a rapidly growing area, 7.5 million. And you get to 2015, 9 million. This is completely taken over this area. And you get to 2025, where about two thirds of the, it's a little less, but about two thirds is urbanized and you have a population close to, to, to 12 million right now. Um, they have about 12 million, I mean, 11 million. Okay, so we look at one index of vulnerability and that index is the percent of the population receiving less than 40 liters per capita per day, per day during a drought. And what we see is that this vulnerability index is that under the circumstances uh, that they were in, uh, 
a lot of people, like 75% of the peri-urban and 65, 65% of the, uh, of the city itself is in this situation where they get 40 liters per capita per day, which is a very low number. Then you have increased, then as this urbanization occurs, two thirds happen. Two thirds get this only 40, basic, excuse me, 99% get 40 liters per capita per day. And so what we were predicting was that basically no one would get pipe supply beyond about 40 liters per capita per day. And here's what happened. So they had this, it happened sooner than we thought. <laughs> this happened in 2019. And here's the pictures of the reservoir that's full in 18 and 18, it starts to decline. It gets a little, it gets pretty full. And then it starts to decline through 2019 and it goes completely dry. And this other rare goes completely dry. So um, actually what we predicted happened, it just happened a little sooner because population growth happened a little sooner than what we said. So in the remaining few minutes, I just wanna talk about our FUSE project that uh, Werner was uh, kind enough to mention is that this stands for Food, Water, Energy for Urban Sustainable, and Sustainable Environments. And um, we are dealing with the few Food, Water, Energy Nexus. And it consists of Stanford as the uh, lead organization and coordinator, but OFSI has been really instrumental in developing our stakeholder engagement. And I'll mention what we did in that way. And then we have the Helmholtz Center UFC in Germany and the Enyasa in Austria as partners for this um, collaborative group. And we've been working for about three years now together on this. We are a collection of hydrologists, people who know about agriculture, energy, modelers, um, people who do stakeholder engagement, uh, urban sociologists, economists, and people who do integration of all these different fields. And so that's our team. Um, and we're working in two areas. One is Pune, which is a, a wetter area of India. We were formerly over here, now we're over here. And then we have um, this other area, which we're working at is in Jordan, and we're focused on Amman. I'll just mention that there are similarities. They have limited um, access to water. There are intermittent supply systems. They have decaying infrastructure, and they compete for water and energy in, in a sectoral basis between food, energy, and water. Um, difference are, is in climate change. Climate change, climate change impacts are much greater in in in, um, in Jordan than they are in India. India will get maybe even wetter, but it'll have great variability. And Jordan just has twice as many droughts of twice the um, magnitude, and so um, we or twice the duration. And they have intermittency differences. They have a different socioeconomic structure. India is a lot less well off than Jordan. They have political economy differences. Sugar is grown in India and they have different governance systems. So we're working in both of those two areas. And our process is that we have this stakeholder engagement uh, effort, which was run by AFSI and was incredibly successful. And I was, I was taken by it, it was really quite amazing. And then um, we're developing this policy evaluation model. We finished one for Jordan, it took about 25 person years to develop the model. So a lot of people contributed to this model and we're in the midst of that right now for India. And then we're going to um, India as soon as we can get past COVID, which will probably be not even this calendar year. Okay, so what happened in the stakeholder um, engagement is we're trying to get ideas about future challenges and um, from, from the stakeholders. And then we have experts providing solutions. Um, so let's see how that worked. We had an, a, a fabulous set of workshops in India, in Pune. And Karen spent about two months in Pune figuring out who should come to these workshops and who shouldn't come and really vetting all of the people who could contribute and having a great distribution. There was a stakeholder analysis and all that was done. Really excellent. And so we have these different groups that were incredibly engaged incredibly appreciative of what we were trying to get from them, which is what their challenges were. They had various exercises to get them to think about their current challenges and how they're dealing with them, and then what their future challenges are gonna be like, and to scare them a little, saying you're gonna have climate change, you're gonna have prices go up, you're gonna have less resources, what are you gonna do? And then we, we then did that in India, we did that in Jordan, and, and we have, you know, the, the stakeholders were NGOs, were farmers, were people from industry, from people from civil society. And this is the group that we had in, in Jordan. 
And then we had experts and the experts came in and say, okay, we have these challenges, what are the solutions? And we had, a, a, those people were former government officials, including a former minister of water. Um, we had secretary, former secretary general, we had consultants, we had academics. Um, and in, in Jordan, at least in, in, in India, we have less communication with the, with the federal government, but it's really a state controlled system. So we have some communication with the state government. Okay, so that's that. And then we had the experts and they come in and give you these solutions. And that's in Amman. Okay, so that's our, our second set of workshops. And they were also quite engaged. All right, so what are kind of challenges do they come up with? And I'll finish up really shortly here, but we have the challenges are for food, water, energy. We have this triangle and we have urbanization. We're focused on Pune, India, which is a city. Uh, both cities are, you know, uh, roughly the same size, Pune and, and Jordan and Amman. And so in terms of individual aspects of this nexus, we have concern with power outages, concern with uh, solar grid inter uh, um, integration, uh, not receiving water for, not receiving money for energy. We have insufficient metering for water. Um, water is stolen or leaks. Um, and we have degrad degradation of soils. So this is just examples of the kinds of challenges that we found. And then you have ones that are more centered around the city, urban sprawl, affordability in slum areas, water quality and competition for water, and then things at the interfaces between food and energy. You have undependable supply, you have nutrient leach leach leaching, which then affects water quality, and you have dam silting, which makes the energy possibilities from reservoirs less. And then potential interventions. I won't have time to go through this, but I'll give you just an idea of what they are. You, for, we have governance, supply, demand, sh the sugar sector, irrigation, and energy policy. And so under governance, you have existing of, of, of regulations. That's pretty pervasive in places we've seen that they have laws on, on the books, but they don't enforce them. You have local solutions for rainwater harvesting. They wanna know how they can implement that. Um, and can, what would the effect be? And can you reduce non-revenue water, meaning water lost or stolen? Um, there's price supports for sugar. Sugar is a big industry in India and it supplies jobs. So people don't want to see it go, but it, um, it has some negative impacts on society there because it's producing sugar and their diet has, is laden with sugar. Um, adoption of new irrigation technology and, and biofuel and solar PV. Um, are things that we're, we're looking at. So all of these are different interventions that we can do, things that they can do in the face of climate change and socioeconomic growth, growth for which we have scenarios. So we consider moderate climate change, RCP 4.5 and 8.5 as the more severe climate change. And then we use the SSPs to look at socioeconomic growth where we have a fast growth and a slow growth scenario. So right now we're developing the model and we're going to go to India and we're going to Jordan in, um, in September um, to get stakeholder responses and evaluate our model results. So the insights we're getting from this, these um, workshops so far is we've had very good co-creation with the stakeholders. In other words, they have told us what, they, what their challenges are and what their potential solutions are. Many of these we thought up ourselves but we didn't know their priorities and we also didn't think of everything that they think of or what you know, they thought was most important. They have limited capacity to assess policy solutions and interventions. They might suggest things in a particular domain in water, food, or energy, but that could have negative impacts on the rest of the other aspects of the nexus. Um, they're eager for this approach. They really got behind that we were trying to help them, that they were the first people telling us how to guide their system and we weren't being, um, we, we weren't being, uh, dictatorial or in any way providing information to them that, that, that we recommendations that we felt strongly about, we give them lots of choices. Um, so the government has a very short-term approach and limited ability to, on sustain, uh, to think about sustainability in the places that we've been working. They think about water provision on weeks and months and they just can't really get through like long, long-term decadal timeframes when climate change in, and population growth is really gonna kick in. Amman is pretty different than Pune. Amman has um, civil society trusts the government to act. So they relinquish their power to the civil society, to the, to the government. And that seems to be 
the way they function. And in Pune, it's really different. The, the civil society is very proactive and pushes the government to act. So this is our group. Um, you can see we have the group from Stanford, from Yasa, from UFC, and the wonderful stakeholder engagement people who have really changed the nature of our project and made it be um, just so in tune with the group and people there that we just never had that connection before. So with that, I will, I will sign off and I'm interested to hear what the others have to, uh, to say about how this in any way relates to what's going on there. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Steve, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, thanks for your compliments uh, to our work. Uh, there is some uh, questions in the chat uh, that I would like to bring in before I give the floor uh, to the commentators. Um, so there were three questions, no, four questions actually. Um, do you see them? I, I read them to everybody. So one is uh, slight population growth versus reservoir capacity. Where is the extracted water ultimately ending up? Is it not that humans ultimately bring the water back into the system? Um, then um, one other question is, why has, water why has water use so much increased in agriculture? Is it by population growth or changing to other production methods? Then why is desalination so environmentally damaging? Can better, te better technology help? And is, utility, is a utility-based approach, uh, in a utility-based approach, how do you decide who is a rich customer to be charged more and who not? Okay, so those are the four questions that maybe should be not so, I think you're muted. Yes, why don't you please read them individually um, briefly and I'll go through them one at a time. You're muted. Population growth versus reservoir capacity, where is the extracted water ultimately ending up? Is it not that humans ultimately bring the water back into the system? You know, we did a whole analysis of cities all around the world, and we looked at um, cities that get their water from distant areas and saw their vulnerability to that. So it, it's true that you don't necessarily have water where you need it and you go elsewhere to get it. And so that's one solution that some cities have found. But by and large, most of these places that we've been working, the, the water's fairly local. They do have interstate compacts where they're supposed to get water when they demand it from another region, but they, during a drought, all bets are off and they really don't get that water. So yes, they are bringing water, I guess, back into the system. I'm not sure what that means, but it's from, uh, from, an, um, from a distant area. And that is a solution if it were to be abided by. Next question. I can't hear you. Sorry. Why has water use so much increased in agriculture? Is it mainly population growth or changing and more water intensive uh, production methods? Um, you know, population growth has driven agriculture for years. And, and if you go back and you look at the early part of the last century, uh, the percent that went to agriculture was enormous, and it's just a direct function of of, um, of income and how and how of GDP, national GDP, that under under or developing nations um, use a lot of water. Right now, I think I read that India's like ninety percent of the water is going to agriculture. It's just they're a very strong, uh, have a very strong strong stake politically all over in every place, and to get water out of their hands is subsidized. Water is really cheap for industry. In the U.S., it's, it's, we pay 10 times what agriculture pays. So um, they have a very strong foothold on, uh, on, on water, and, and, um, and it's just viewed as a necessary obligation we have to farmers right now. And the next question is, why is desalination so environmentally damaging? Can better technology help? That's a great question. It has been environmentally damaging because it takes a lot of energy to desal water and it's just really expensive. But there is the possibility, especially in Jordan, where you can desal using solar. And so there's actually been experiments um, with both pumping, but I imagine you could do them with solar as, as well it, it, of letting farmers, uh, for example, generate solar power and then use that for agriculture. But you could do that for for, for desal as well. 
and that would bring the price down as photovoltaics come into play and they're and they're really they become cheaper which they have been enormously then then so then desal can be uh, effective the problem is that uh, environmentally you have to get rid of the saline water and that saline water is dense and it sinks to the sinks to the bottom of the ocean where there's benthic organisms and and it can destroy um, fish habitat and then in the in the case of jordan you have the dead sea and the Dead Sea is declining on the shorelines coming in by one meter per year. But if you did Red Sea DSC desal, you take that brine and shoot it down below sea level to the Dead Sea. And that has environmental consequences. So there's a lot of people who think you shouldn't do that because the Dead Sea has a unique species that live in this highly saline water and they don't want to upset that. And um, the last question is, in the utility-based approach, how do you decide who are the rich customers to be charged more and who not? And who can you, how can you put this into action? Yeah, so um, it's pretty clear who the water users are. They don't have to be rich, they just have to be water users, but by and large, they are the richer people. And so what we do in our model is we assume a certain level of, of growth in economic well-being. So you know, 4% a year people move from one tier to the next of economic well-being uh, increase. And so as you get more and more people moving up this ladder, they can afford to, to pay, you know, water for, for water. Um, the people who are using tanker water, for example, those are people who can contribute to the utility system by paying higher tariffs for the water system and and kind of dismantle the, the tanker system. The tanker system is an ad hoc system because governments don't have the agility to to really respond to an emergency situation and they should that's the role of government to protect the health safety and welfare of people and they're unable to do that um, so if you believe in government and you believe that aspect of government then then it's not hard to to tax the the, the big water users which happen to be the richer people okay so thank you very much for your insightful presentations and also for answering all the questions. Uh, maybe also the, the question of taxing or, or different tariffs for different water users can then also be addressed by uh, Wolfgang Gruber in his, in his comment maybe. But I first uh, want to welcome very warmly uh, Theresa Schütz from the Austrian uh, Development Corporation. Um, the Austrian Development Corporation uh, is, has, has, uh, water has been one priority sector of the Austrian Development Corporation for many years. Um, and um, ADA supports partner countries in setting up sustainable water supply and sanitation facilities and strengthening responsible institutions. And has also focused on the food water energy nexus. So very um, timely and suitable to today's topic. I'm very happy to introduce Theresa Schütz to you. She's water and sanitation advisor at the Austrian Development Agency, mainly responsible for the portfolio in Sub-Saharan Africa, Uganda, Mozambique, and regional programs. Uh, she holds a master's degree in civil engineering and water resources from the University of Life, water resources management from the University of Life Sciences and Natural Resources, BOKU, and um, a master's degree in water sanitation and health engineering from the University of Leeds, UK. And uh, her, her working experience in water project is in El Salvador, Jamaica, Ghana, and Mozambique, amongst others. So, um, yeah, Therese, I'm very much looking forward to your um, comment and to see what the approach of the Austrian Development Corporation is. And yeah, maybe also your thoughts about what you just heard, how this fits together with your experiences. The floor is yours. Thank you, Karin. And good afternoon also from my side to everyone. And uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. I will talk a little bit about the Austrian Development Corporation's activities in the water sector how we approach the water, energy, and food security nexus. And I will also give you two examples on how we try to address the challenges that we see in implementing the nexus approach. So as you mentioned, the water and sanitation sector is a priority sector for the Austrian Development Corporation or shortly ADC. And the Austrian Development Agency, which is the operational unit of ADC supports a variety of water supply and sanitation projects uh, of selected global and regional organizations as well as in our uh, partner countries, Albania, Moldova, Mozambique, Palestine, and Uganda. And the annual budget varies over the years, but uh, in 2020, it was approximately 8.2 million euros. 
that were spent for water and sanitation project, which is approximately 8% of the total operative um, ADA budget. So what is it exactly that ADC is implementing in the water sector? I will try to give you a very broad overview of our activities. Um, ADC relies on a mix of interventions in the water sector, so from technical measures, mainly in rural water supply and sanitation, uh, water for production, up to integrated water resources management. And there's a strong focus on long-term integrated sector approaches, so most importantly on institutional and financial requirements for operation and maintenance. And in this sense, ADC has also focused on strengthening public administration. Uh, and supporting partner countries in improving their legal framework. So how does, um, how does ADC address the water, energy and food security nexus? How does it come into play in our work? Um, so we've heard in the previous presentation that water, energy and food security are closely interlinked and depend on each other. And in some of our countries, these interlinkages are more subtle in others, such as Palestine, they become very prominent. So in Gaza, for example, the main water source um, is saline groundwater that needs to be desalinated, and this requires huge amounts of energy, which is also not readily available in Gaza. So that trade-off becomes very imminent when there's only two hours of, of electricity to access drinking water on the other side. So ADC has kind of adopted a, a specific vision of the Nexus. So the main goal is to to raise the overall impact of our development efforts. So we're focusing on the interactions, synergies, and possible trade-off among these sectoral interventions. So it doesn't mean, for example, that if we have a water project that there has to be an uh, energy component or, a, or an agriculture component, for example. It's more of um, looking at it kind of from a bird's eye view to get kind of the greatest possible holistic development impact that we can achieve in a certain intervention. And that also means for us going beyond the sectors um, where climate protection, adaptation to climate change comes into play, but also social aspects such as gender equality and social inclusion. And uh, some of the major challenges that we see in applying and implementing the Nexus approach are, firstly, there's a strong silo thinking between the three sectors. Um, so most of the time, the responsible institutions uh, vary for the three sectors and they don't really cooperate with each other or work together. And there's also a lack of kind of uh, sound interoperable data that can be exchanged between these institutions. And the second challenge um, that I see is what I've mentioned before is kind of this thinking beyond the sectors in a holistic manner. So thinking about climate change and thinking about gender equality and social inclusion. So I want to give you two examples of how ADC is addressing these challenges. The first project is actually called Nexus. Uh, this is an example from Southeastern Europe, uh, which shows how to, how to take a holistic approach to cross-sector and also transboundary water management. And it's trying to tackle the silos between institutions on a national level and also regional level. So especially for water resources management, that regional level is also very important. Um, and in this project, there are a total of 860 people from over 350 institutions that are dealing with the Nexus approach, among other things, with the help of a simulation game. So in the game, the players slip into the roles of two different states that are located on the banks of the same river, and they have to reconcile the conflicting interests of water management, food production, energy generation, also environmental protection, and um, especially like slipping into the role that they don't have in real life, let's say. So the, the second program that I wanted to showcase is called Water Climate and Development Program Gender. I wanted to showcase this program in particular because it's a good example on how to think beyond the sectors and beyond technical solutions to highlight kind of the need to think of also about social aspects, which um, we water people like to forget most of the time. Um, it's because if we, if drivers of vulnerability, such as gender inequality or um, inequitable access to natural resources is not taken into account, uh, we may create intervention that reinforce or redistribute or create new vulnerabilities. And that's what we're trying to avoid, obviously. 
So the program, which is uh, implemented by the Global Water Partnership, is a five-year regional uh, gender marker two intervention in sub-Saharan Africa, um, which is piloted in five countries and aims to promote a gender transformative um, planning, decision making, and also institutional development for climate resilient water investments in Africa. So it's combining all the topics, it's climate, it's gender, and it's water. Um, the program has just started. However, their um, co comprehensive gender analysis for each of the countries were already conducted. And I want to highlight a few main takeaways from these analysis that are quite relevant also when you look at it from a nexus perspective. So the first one is that uh, gender inequalities exist in access to and control of natural productive resources, such as land, water, and energy uh, that are necessary for water security and climate resilience. Uh, there's a low level of understanding and appreciation on how men and women are differently impacted by and respond to climate change. Um, in most cases, there's also inequalities in decision-making positions, so political representation at all different kinds of levels are dominated by men. And there were also gaps identified in terms of inadequate stakeholder platforms to facilitate dialogue. So this also relates back to what we've heard before, um, especially with um, integrated water resources management, the stakeholder participation is a really important process. And we need to also think about how can we, how can we, uh, promote gender equality in that aspect, how can we promote uh, climate resilience? So by addressing these gaps, the program is basically trying to mobilize political commitment for this gender transformative action to kind of remove systematic barriers. And there will also be small local demonstration projects to kind of showcase how this can be implemented. So with these two examples, I kind of want to conclude my commentary and I thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much. My, uh, I, uh, my mouse was, uh, had disappeared, so I couldn't unmute myself. Thank you very much, Teresa, for these insights in, in uh, the projects and programs of the Austrian Development Corporation. I think this sounded very interesting and also kind of fits together, like to, to get over the silo thinking and to put yourself in each other's shoes and to understand each other's viewpoints. I think, I think this is a very important component and also, also the social aspect uh, of different power relations and different possibilities of having access to, to water and to decision making also. Um, yeah, so the, uh, thank you very much. I think there was no specific uh, question to you, uh, but uh, we'll, have, we'll have a discussion afterwards and to bring all those inputs together. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy now uh, to, uh, to welcome Wolfgang Gruber. Uh, in our discussion, he's head of staff of the staff unit management systems and representation of interest at the city of Vienna department 31, which is the Vienna water. Um, and um, Wolfgang Gruber has not only a lot of experience working for the city of Vienna, but before he has also worked amongst others as a project engineer for TBV in international water projects in Burundi, Guatemala, Nicaragua and Romania. Um, so the, he can also, he can not only tell us about the city of Vienna, but can also relate to the situation in different other countries. He's approved quality manager and internal quality auditor and holds a degree in environmental sciences and civil engineering from the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences, BOKU, in Vienna. So my question is, uh, and uh, many of you know, Vienna is always presented as a showcase for sustainable water management. So we would like to know how did this come about and which decisions led to the situation and what can we learn from it. But also does Vienna have challenges in water supply and, uh, and uh, is climate change affecting the water situation in Vienna? So Mr. Gruber, I'm very happy to welcome you and the floor is yours. Thank you, Karen, for your nice introduction. Hello to everybody. Greetings from Vienna. Uh, I would start to say that, that in general, water supply finds its boundary conditions within all the, the natural, the technical, the economic and, and the social framework. And I would like to start uh, with the social uh, framework. 
I think of utmost importance is is the separation of powers. Like in US, US we say the checks and, and balances. So it's important the, the legislative, the judiciary and the executive authorities are well separated and controlling each other. And as a fourth power, we could also say the, the free journalism as a uh, fourth control in a, in a community. And these four powers are imminent to, to uh, consider and, and uh, to realize that the public interest uh, is, is obeyed and, and not particular interest from some stakeholders who get access to because they have more money or better political connections and so on. Uh, in with, with respect to Vienna, there is a, a law in, in the city, city is also a country in Austria. Uh, it's the same Vienna has both uh, 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 qualities actually. And so there's a the Vienna Water Act uh, where the whole water supply is, is regulated. And it says that it has to be by municipal entities performed. And there is also a, a constitutional clause, which says it needs a two thirds majority in the city council if uh, some uh, uh, areas or, or, or uh, uh, facilities or something uh, should be sold. So this is very difficult uh, to, to do actually. Uh, from the technical part, uh, we have to say that we have a rather good technical infrastructure. We count with a leakage rate of about 7% only. So also in the last years, we had uh, a good performance in this case. Uh, the, the, the strategic uh, access to this uh, network rehabilitation was performed with University of Graz. Uh, where we had studies and to get a prioritization of which uh, which pipes should be uh, priorized in in renovation. So it depends on the on the tube on the pipe material. It depends uh, where it is uh, situated. So on on traffic uh, traffic stress which the pipe uh, has to suffer. And by this we try to find the optimum. Uh, uh, of economic, the right uh, point of time to to change this this pipe, and so we are rather successful in this case, uh, because there are different uh, material like cast iron and ductile iron and and cement and the best of cement and uh, steel. So there are different depending on the age which uh, technology was uh, at hand. Uh, about 95% of the water in Vienna comes from mountain spring water and about 5% is groundwater. So usually the whole uh, time of the year we have only spring water and in the times when we have rehabilitation works on the spring mountain mains, there is also introduced groundwater. Uh, Vienna has uh, 31 reservoirs of water and we have a daily consumption of about 400,000 cubic meters and the volume, the total volume of reservoirs is 1.6 million cubic meters. So we have four times, four days of volume at disposal, at disposition. Um, we count with about 570 employees. So we are all public employees. So it's, it's a department of city administration, Vienna Waterworks. We, it's, it's, a, it's a facility and it's, it's a department at the same time. And uh, so it's, uh, and we cover actually the whole range from, from room service up to engineering. So, uh, we were in the position that we really can cover the whole uh, topics uh, that a water entity has to deal with. And so I think it's very important that we count with really uh, skilled staff uh, 
who actually know what to do. So uh, it's I think it's very important uh, that uh, all negotiations, uh, be it with uh, uh, private companies, with authorities, uh, can be uh, conducted uh, on a level playing field so that nobody can tell you something which maybe is not so <laughs> the, the case. Uh, we do the planning actually in the house. Uh, some specific uh, points like uh, uh, a static problems or something is done with uh, external companies and also construction works. So this is all uh, done by private construction companies. So we just uh, are uh, looking at, at the building sites and controlling, but the work is done by private companies. So we don't have uh, uh, the, the machinery for, for main trenches and so on. Uh, from the natural point of view, uh, the, the water actually originates from uh, uh, the, the from natural, physical, chemical, uh, and biological processes, which of course request their area and request their time. Uh, the whole area of Vienna city is 415 square kilometers. And the, only the protection zones of the spring water catchment areas are about 700 uh, square kilometers. So it's, uh, Almost a double of the area of Vienna is catchment area, which is protected, which are natural protected zones. So, of course, this is an absolute privilege that we can deal with. And uh, so the focus, of course, is going into protecting these areas. And here we are working together with the forestry department of Vienna. So we are in, in the uh, areas, in the catchment areas, we're working together. And uh, there is uh, a proactive resource management in these areas. And, and the water protection uh, takes clear precedence uh, over uh, financial earnings uh, of timber harvesting, for instance. So uh, the, we are now seeing that uh, the monocultures which were planted about 100 years ago which is uh, conifer it, it's a spruce species uh, is very vulnerable uh, to the increasing occurring storm events and and heat spells uh, which come combined with uh, infestations of of the bark people so uh, the forestry department now tries to uh, Make take measures in 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 sense that uh, we now uh, th these uh, woods are replaced by more resilient uh, species of mixed for uh, forests uh, with also of course broad leafed uh, tree species and and but also conifers like firs for instance so these mixed forests are much more uh, resilient against this impact. Um, The, also, of course, we are always monitoring the water quality, which comes from spring water and also, of course, from groundwater. The groundwater wells uh, uh, in, in, main time, in, in a, a great extent are inside Vienna, but they are in the national park of the Vienna floodplains of, of the Danube. So this is also a protected area, but of course this is it's a mixture of groundwater and riverbank filtration water. Uh, and and last the, the financial aspect, of course, it's I think very important. So we can cover our whole costs with the tariffs that we charge. It this is now we, we charge 1.92. Uh, euros per cubic meter water. It, this is, includes 10% value added tax. And, uh, and the consumers have to pay also about the same uh, uh, amount of, for the water treatment and, and sewer system. 
So it's a little bit, it's 2.11, I think it's, it's the, the charge for, for uh, wastewater. So it's about four euros you have to pay as a consumer for, for the water. And uh, the price is uh, the same for everybody. It's, it doesn't matter whether you're poor, whether you're rich, whether you're a company, uh, it's always the same price. Uh, because the, the topic of uh, social uh, uh, problems with, with people who, who could not afford this is topic of uh, social departments. So there it is looked whether people need a uh, subsidy, but they get the subsidy because they look, they have a much better look, of course, how, uh, of how which necessities does, does somebody have because they know the financial background of a person and we as a utility we would not like to mess with uh, social problems of somebody be because we don't know what he's really earning or is is he only saying that he's poor so uh, this I think it's an also an important aspect and uh, of course uh, the, the the what we heard before in in the presentation of Stephen, we saw the, the immense impact of growing uh, population. Uh, so of course, uh, the, the more people are living in an area, the, the more, uh, the, the higher the claims of these areas and the more difficult, of course, it is to find a compromise uh, how to use it. Uh, in, in our case, it's much more easier because it's mountainous region, so we have uh, the topic of, of timber production, we have the topic of pasture, we have the topic of hunting, but these are rather low level uh, claims. And so it's um, much more uh, easy for us to uh, look af after these uh, problems. And, and besides the half of the area of this uh, catchment area belongs to the city of Vienna. So it's our own property. So it's much more easy, of course, to, uh, to decide how to, how to use it. That's my first okay. introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting insight into the Vienna water system. And I also have to say, I'm, I'm living in Vienna, but for me also the water supply is, uh, I'm, I take it for so granted that I even didn't know that we had 31 reservoirs, for instance, and four days of guaranteed water supply. Uh, so I think people are so used to have good quality water that they don't even are aware about what is done and where it really comes from. And, um, and we talked also in our, when, when, when we talked before um, this conference, uh, we, we said that maybe the decision of getting the spring water from the mountains uh, in other regions wouldn't even be possible today because maybe maybe this would need much more discussion and maybe those regions wouldn't be, wouldn't agree to give all this water to Vienna. So this is, was a very uh, long term decision actually from from the emperor uh, in this. Yeah, case, actually, it it's, <laughs> it it was about 180. 63 was the decision to to make this because before Pro Vienna had really problems with uh, waterborne diseases with cholera and and so on because of course the water was uh, uh, used by by wells within the city and also of course the wastewater there were only pits and and so used so it was a short a circular <laughs> a reuse of, of wastewater of course with all the problems. And so at this time, the decision was done to get it uh, from, this, uh, from this distance of, of 150, 180 kilometers uh, into the city. And uh, it was a really great decision then. And of course, it was a uh, decree of, of the emperor to uh, concess uh, Vienna, these areas and, and, and the water supply. Because today it would be I would say almost impossible to uh, negotiate with another country to get such amount of, of water. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. There have now been several questions in the chat. Um, one goes to Teresa, uh, which uh, is Vienna shows that a clear legal framework and institutional technical capacities uh, capacities are important for effective water management. Which role does institutional capacity building play in the approach of the Austrian development? 
cooperation. Um, maybe you can address this question. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, so capacity building is basically always a accompanying measure that we apply in any kind of project that we have and whether it be infrastructure or inf integrated water resource management, which sometimes also involves infrastructure. And the approaches are differently. It really depends on the context in the country that we're working in, also the history of the, of the country. So for example, we've been uh, implementing a wastewater treatment plant in Moldova, and there has been a lot of capacity building going on um, when it comes basically to the training of the operators, for example, but also on how we can um, adapt the, the tariff to make it more um, cost co covering, which is quite a difficult task uh, in Moldova. Um, or another example would be where I think that's that kind of fits to institutional capacity building. Uh, we've been active in, since the 90s, I think, in, in Uganda. And where we established, um, actually based on an upper Austrian model, um, the so-called umbrellas for water supply and sanitation that support um, smaller local operators in the peri-urban and rural areas of Uganda, um, which has been really successful and has been now adopted by the Ministry of Water in, in Uganda to, to actual water authorities. So these umbrellas are now water authorities that took over the management from local government and smaller local operators um, to, to just improve the service. So, this has been two, two examples on, on what we've been working on. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Um, there is one question for uh, Steve. How strong is the impact of exported water, like virtual water, uh, on the increase of water demand in the investigators' areas in the FUSE project? Have you looked at the virtual water aspect as well? Yeah, interesting question. Um, First of all, a couple of other pieces of information. For example, in Jordan, they are incredibly advanced in their recycling and reuse of water. 95 plus percent of the wastewater in Amman, the capital city and biggest city, and Urbid is actually reused, is recycled and reused. And it's used for, um, for irrigation. So they, uh, it's not virtual water, but there is, they've already tapped that source, which is one thing that nobody raises a question, but it's actually pretty incredible that they're able to do this. We have a sub project involving um, footprints. And so that's actually a, a, an element of the entire few study. That's a sub project run by the UFC team. And they're looking at, at footprints for food, water, and energy. And we're seeing how that goes. I, I, my gut feeling is societally, the Jordanians want to have some food security. There's no such thing as sovereign nationwide food security in the, any of these countries or anywhere in the world, really. Um, but they, they want to be able to grow their own tomatoes and cucumbers and have them locally. And so they think that, um, you know, that water use would, would trump any, any kind of virtual water that they might you know, think about balancing out in their exports. And in terms of imports, I don't think it's been a policy to import um, high water using goods as far as I'm aware of this. Nothing been done policy-wise in the country. Okay, thank you. I just add something. I heard uh, there's, a, there's a new report uh, on, water, on, on resource use in Austria that came out that showed that in Austria, the virtual water footprint is six times higher than the actual water consumption in Austria. So I think it's like, I don't, I don't remember how many liters, but it's, it was six times, I mean, the water footprint is six times higher. The water used in our consumption is six times higher than the water used um, within, within Austria. So that's a lot, actually. Um, then um, there is a question um, to Wolfgang, how much water does a person in Vienna consume on average per day and has there been a change over the years? Actually, the water demand was increasing uh, until about uh, 1970. It was always increasing and then there was uh, we, we saw that, well, what were I, <laughs> my colleagues before, they saw that it, 
Vienna runs in difficulties because there is not so much uh, production. And there was made a, a project uh, that was uh, initiated a, a, a department within our uh, entity, which is called uh, uh, like a service, uh, uh, how to translate this, <laughs> uh, uh, Department for Private uh, Service Connections, actually. And so, because there was clear that in all the toilets and so on, always water was tickling and this was a huge consumption. And uh, it's incredible that uh, although the population is increasing, we are now counting with 1.9 million inhabitants in Vienna. Uh, since uh, 1970, the demand is, is, is uh, reducing. So it's, uh, we are now the last four years, we're about the same because Vienna is growing really fast now, the last years. And, but it was really possible to reduce uh, uh, also this consumption within the households uh, because this was actually, it was used because it was running through the water meters, but nevertheless, it was, nevertheless, it was useless, of course, because it's, uh, there were only uh, leaks within the households and this could be really reduced in an incredible manner. And so we now, can say about 130 liters per person. And additionally, there's industry and so on. Mm -hmm. That's a good example how water consumption can be reduced by quite yeah. simple measures, actually. Um, and of course, we have a high tariff on, on the consumption because you pay every cubic meter. So there, there's almost, you have a fixed rate, which is for the water meter. So for the water meter, you pay depending on the size of the water meter. Uh, it's it's starting by uh, actually 50 uh, euros a year up to 300 euros a year. This is the only fixed rate and the rest is uh, is flexible because depending only on the use. Mm -hmm. Okay, then there is one question for uh, Teresa and for Steve. How do you um, see the role of multinational companies um, in, uh, in water management utilities in India and in other countries? To which extent are private utilities partners in uh, Like, how do you see in general um, the, the role of transnational companies in, in water and what is, to which extent are private utilities partners in development cooperation? Uh, I don't know who wants Let's to Let's defer to uh, Teresa, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this topic is very controversial. <laughs> And there are definitely, I'd say, some success stories, but also very bad examples. Um, for the Austrian Development Corporation, I would say that we, we don't really work with private utilities, so big private utilities. We mostly work with public utilities. Um, the only private entity that I would see is on a very, very local level, on an NGO level, where we work maybe with smaller local operators of um, very small water supply systems. In, in rural areas, for example, in Uganda. Um, but inherently, what I would like to say, because um, there was the question in development cooperation, um, the Austrian development cooperation, at least, um, he's, um, or we apply to the human right to water and the human right to sanitation. So this is a, a principle that we abide to and that we work to. to so all the intervention have to um, provide water in a safe and quantitative way. Uh, an affordable way, so that why we, we don't really have the experience with working with big private utilities, to be honest. Yeah, I would. How do you assess the role of multinational I, companies? Uh, let me just do it by country because Jordan has a, a strong policy of BOT, build, operate, transfer, um, in terms of building their facilities, and then they operate them for a while, they train the folks and then they transfer those over. And I think that's been fairly successful for them. Um, and that's now kind of filtering down to the smaller scale treatment facilities for, for, for water um, and, and they reuse that water. So I think that's their trick is to, to get more water is to just reuse it, which is a good trick. Um, the, it's centralized in Jordan. The Jordan Water Authority controls what water goes to two different companies that then um, 
are private companies that actually administer the, the local level water transfers. And they're not multinational as far as I know, they're just low, you know, regional companies. And that seems to be working. In all of these countries that we work in, it's uh, the level of corruption is fairly high. And it's very hard to know, you know, what really happens. But if it's working, you know, then we don't suggest fixing it. Um, India, that's true. Uh, you know, you have to wonder why they're going so heavily into building these really expensive desal plants when, you know, there's not some money transferring. I mean, they're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, at least, and billions sometimes of just getting these plants built up the capacity that they need. And so, um, you know, I think there's an issue of, you know, how those contracts get let. Uh, that's beyond the scope of what we're doing. We, we are, by the way, 70% social scientists in our consortium of views. So we're not, we don't, <laughs> we embrace all the social and economic so sides of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there is another question um, to you, and maybe I can also say something about this, to what, what role played the gender dimension in Poon and Aman in the FUSE project? How was this addressed in the stakeholder process? I, I, I'm going to defer to you, Karen, but what I observed was that there was incredible gender uh, equity in the, in the stakeholders. I think you picked um, uh, a, a lot of uh, men and women, and, and so we had good participation from both. But you spent two months in India, so you can, and we spent, um, I think, collectively, you and Inez spent I think, of several weeks in, in Jordan. So your best answer to that. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, I mean, we, we made sure in, in the stakeholder participation um, that there is gender equality and that um, interests of women are also represented. I mean, the FUSE project itself, the model, doesn't have a strong gender focus um, as much as I know, but, but the surveys, I mean, there are also surveys that are done that, of course, differentiate between access for women to water in slum areas, for instance, and there will be different analysis for men and women and, and how, how they access water and how, uh, or also how much time they spend for, 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 for getting access to water. So women spend a lot more time carrying water, walking, a, a lot more time of their day spent by securing the water access of their family. So this is, this is quite one, one of our colleagues at UFZ is doing his dissertation uh, within the project. And he, he has found out that women uh, uh, like disproportionately spend much more time and therefore also it, it costs more for them to, to get access to water. Uh, we had one very interesting example in Jordan uh, where we invited um, an organization called Wise Water Women. And uh, they're actually a group of female plumbers. So it's a group of women who get um, uh, training as plumbers and they go to different houses in Jordan to fix the pipes in the households. And this is several aspects uh, why this is a really good project. And we, ha we have invited them in our stakeholder workshops because one is uh, they're a good example that women can do something technical and, and can, have a, can have a job. And they, those women are really empowered in their own families because they go out and they earn money. And the second aspect is uh, that women are not allowed to, to let men in their house when the men are not around. So when they have leaking pipes, the women in Jordan are not allowed to call a plumber. And if it's a man, uh, they, they, they're not allowed to come. They have to wait until the, the, the husband is back to let them in. So they can, cannot get the water repaired, basically. So now they're allowed to let women into the, into the household. They can fix the pipes. And also some training is done and maybe also some role modeling that women can do some different jobs. So this is, I think, a very good project, uh, which is on one hand empowering women uh, helping to fix pipes during the day because men wouldn't be allowed in and also having quite a lot of a systemic aspect because of, of also a kind of a model um, a, mo a model effect on, on, on other women. So this is something we've, we've, we've taken up. I would add one more thing to that, which is that in the Ch uh, Chennai study, we did an analysis using the model of what the opportunity cost of time was for the women carrying and children carrying those, that water. And it was about half the minimum wage. So that's, that's what they would have gotten paid if you paid them. I mean, mm -hmm. um, if you were allowed to pay them that. Um, so I think that's an important thing. And the other, uh, I just read a paper recently that showed that the amount of time they spend in Pune, which is our field area, 
is about two hours per day on average um, to collect water. And they didn't specify, and I wrote to the author to find out what the demographic was of that group, but probably the slum areas and other areas where they're just, um, they have to walk to get water. But it's a lot, of, a lot of human time going into just getting water. Yeah, thank you. My, my colleague, uh, Jonas, just uh, brought to my attention that I had uh, forgot one question that was come in the chat, that came in the chat before. Um, uh, maybe, I think all of you could, could answer part of this. What is the share of meat production and agriculture when it comes to water consumption? And what about environmental protection in order to avoid reduce water contamination, both in urban and rural context? Um, what about environmental protection in order to avoid reduce water contamination? I can, mm -hmm. I can start on that one. Mm -hmm. So we don't specifically keep track of meat, but we do keep track of fodder crops. And so um, the, the water aspect of it is accounted for because we have a model of farmer behavior. It's a, a, an, a, an economic model of farmer behavior that they grow profitable crops that they can, they can manage to grow. And so if they grow fodder crops, we know how much water is used and that must be good. People don't eat that. So that's going to, 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 um, to feed animals. So that's the first part. Environmental protection is really tricky. I, well, the more I work in countries um, that I'm working in, environment is the last thing on the list. It just when people need water, the environment goes out the window. They, they, they dry up all the streams and they don't get that what replenishes the water is not the water you can use. That's a myth. Water goes in and water was coming out before you got there. And if you take any of it out, you're stopping water from going out, for example, to springs and to the lakes <laughs> and to baseball and rivers. So environment just goes out. As far as the water quality aspects go, we distinguish between potable and non-potable water. And as to the degree that you can use non-potable water for, for cleaning and other aspects of, of living, um, then you win. So it doesn't have to be totally potable to be useful water. Okay. Um, I would like to mention a, a feature that I experienced in, in Guatemala where we had this project with the other, <laughs> as it was, uh, it was in, in end of 90s, uh, beginning of 2000. And this was the water supply of the city of Quetzaltenango. And we also looked uh, at the rural er areas uh, uh, around the city. And there was the question of, of such a village uh, that we could make a water supply. And, but the problem there was that the population was not willing to pay. They said, no, if it's coming from the authority, it has to be free because it's the state. And then we said, well, of course, uh, but now you pay for the private trucks and the price was about three times higher. They paid for the private. No, this is private. The, he comes with the truck. Of course, we have to pay him. But if there is, uh, is a network, it's from the state, it has to be free. And so we abandoned this village because it, it had no use. So it was incredible for me. And this also uh, stresses the, the, the point that it's very important to have a confidence in, in your public entities, that you can trust that there is a, a balance of this power and, and that they are acting in, in the public interest, but actually there, this was not the case, of course. Mm -hmm. And you know, in India, that's, that's true pervasively that the water is considered a, a, a human right and a good and they don't charge for it. And it's a big problem. And every, not every, but many politicians <laughs> claim, you know, I'm gonna make sure you get free water. And, and so that's what gets votes, what gets votes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. We have, uh... A last question, um, concluding question to all of you um, from uh, Werner Ratzer. He said, looking forward, what are the key policy priorities for promoting sustainable water management in the future? So what, if you could decide, um, what would be your priorities for sustainable water management? Um, and um, yeah, and what is, like in the, what is missing in the current institutional approach to waters management research also, this goes also to you. And, uh, and also in practical, maybe development cooperation, but also in the practical approaches in water management in cities 
uh, what 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 would what should be the policy priorities? Um, I don't know, Wolfgang. Should I should I start with you? And because we also didn't say is is Vienna somehow affected by climate change, or maybe other cities that are not such advantage that have not the advantage of Vienna of having such good water supply. What is what is the future of the Austrian water supply, and what what should be the policy priorities that you see? Uh, well, of course, climate change, we note when, when you look at the days with temperature more than 30 degrees, you see from the 50s that it's really, really impressively increasing. Uh, so, of course, it happens. And, and I'm, I'm glad that the last years also, also politicians <laughs> are, are seeing this problem because before this was also always denied there's something like this existing. And so we now see also really changes in, 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 in acting. And uh, well, in, in Vienna, actually we don't see really uh, severe problems. So we think that we can uh, furthermore guarantee the amounts of water that we need. So as I said before, we, we try to uh, really uh, prevent uh, to, to uh, tender these catchment areas and uh, try to get the forests in a good uh, uh, quality so that the infiltration of, of water and, and the purification of water is, is guaranteed. Uh, also, we, we look uh, to, to reduce, of course, leakage, but now we're really on, on, a, uh, on a stage where it's there's not much more to do actually because it's uh, we are really uh, on an end where it's rather difficult to to uh, uh, do more actually. So we we also have less uh, uh, pipe ruptures in the last years. So here we are in a good way. And of course, uh, what we also do is working with children. So we have the Vienna Water School where uh, the children from schools, they go one week there and there is, uh, they have one week of uh, introduction in, in the water topic. So they learn, they can choose also from historical uh, development of the water supply, uh, of, the, of the natural uh, procedure of, of water, how is it, how the, the water cycle works and so on and to, to create this uh, knowledge and, and uh, uh, also, also in, 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 in children, of course, because they are future consumers and, and uh, 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 our clients actually. And uh, furthermore, well, the city of Vienna has now, I think it was in, in, in uh, as a consequence of the Fridays for Future uh, movement, that the actual uh, program of, of the city government has really strong impacts of energy uh, production of renewal uh, of, of uh, new uh, renewable uh, energy resources of, of solar power and so on. And so there are strong uh, impacts on, on climate uh, to, to reduce the climate change, but also to take measures against the heating that we cannot prevent anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Teresa, if you could take any decision you wanted, what would be your priorities uh, in, in water management and also in, in, in cooperation projects? Um, <laughs> difficult question. I think I would go for um, focusing on implementing integrated water resources management and the, the kind of principles that come with it. Um, and for example, river basin management plans, which is um, partly lacking in, in most of the countries, especially on a, on a transboundary level. Um, and what we really need to work on also is that we don't really have um, enough data available to make make sound decisions on that. So the decision basis is kind of missing to monitor also the impact that climate change has on the resources. And, and then on the next step also, if you have that data, how can you share it between institutions, between countries, nations, so you can 
you can be more sustainable in, in your water management approach. Um, and I think this is one of the, the bigger challenges that we also face in, in implementing our project in, in several countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think, uh, I think Steve can say a lot about missing data. <laughs> we have been uh, having this issue quite a lot in India and, uh, and also in Jordan. So uh, thank you, Teresa. Uh, Steve, if you could take any decision uh, what, what in, in research uh, priorities, but also policy priorities, what, what would be your... Okay, it's, a, it's, it's not a simple question. It's not a simple answer. I, you have different areas with different needs. And we're talking about <clears throat> Vienna. We're talking about, you know, modern, pretty water endowed groups that, you know, we have these rules about water scarcity, that we have water stress if you're less than 1700 cubic meters per person per year. And I think Vienna is in the many thousands. And uh, Chennai is like 1500. So there's starting to be water stress. <laughs> Pune is probably, you know, 1,500. Okay, but Jordan is 100. 5,000 is scarcity. You know, it's like super scarcity. And so, you know, 500 is like really absolute scarcity. 100 is really ridiculous. So they are in big trouble. And, and so they have to be more aware that whatever they're trying to do will not work. And they have to go beyond the boundaries of the country and they have to make deals with places that have water such as Israel, and that's a political decision and they have to confront um, and they have to be able to uh, afford even desal, which I'm not wild about, but I think they have to be, they have, if they don't do that, they're, they're, they're gonna have a position where 90% of their poor people have less than 40 liters per capita at the mid-century or beyond. So, so that's one thing. And I think the integrated water management that Teresa mentioned is really essential. One thing we showed is that the illegal tanker market in uh, in Jordan is eleven times about eleven times the size of the legal tanker market. <laughs> so you know that's huge. And until the government woke up to the fact they disagreed with our conclusion, until they woke up to the fact that they could charge money for that, they didn't believe it. And then they said, "Oh, that must be true, and we could charge for it." Okay. Then the other place I I would say that um, in India the real management situation is balancing the needs to protect against droughts and floods. Under climate change, which is really important there, it's going to get wetter, probably, or stay the same in terms of rainfall. But the variability is incredible. It looks like it's going to get really large. People in, those, in the situations that we're in, in India, where we're working, don't die from droughts. They just suffer but they die from floods. And in 2019, there was a bunch of people that died in floods there. So they have to learn to manage their system and that's a technical matter. They should be able to manage this in a way that they don't kill people. So we'll leave it there. Thank you very much uh, for this insight and also for these uh, ideas and proposals. So I think, um, like integrated uh, water management to look at different aspects and to look at different aspects of water management, also how to deal with floods and to deal with droughts and how to balance uh, the very high fluctuations now that are, that are coming uh, in, in many regions in water is, 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 is really a huge um, challenge and something that really should be tackled. Uh, and we heard a lot, lot more proposals and a lot more insights also in different aspects of, of water resources and, and, and management and um, and I think there's an agreement, there's a lot to be done, there's a lot of research still to be done, and uh, a lot of cooperation between research and policies and stakeholders to advance um, with, uh, like to secure water supply also in the future and, and, and to tackle the challenges that are, that are not only now, but they're coming ahead and they will be even stronger um, in, the next, in the next decades. So thank you very much for your inputs and for your insights. And uh, I asked Werner to, to, to say some uh, words at the end. So uh, please, Jonas, bring Werner back to the stage. Okay, um, well, I start anyway. Um, well, thanks a lot for a very interesting uh, debate. Um, that has, from my point of view, highlighted the very complex nature of, of all the issues involved. Um, I mean, um, I think that research and also applied um, development cooperation and water policies um, um, have, have made um, a lot of 
kind of advances in, 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 the, in, in the way they understand the problems and the inter interrelations uh, between the problems. Uh, so I also think that integrated water management, taking account of these of the nexus approach and, and the many interfaces between different social, economic, and natural domains um, is certainly very important. But what we've seen uh, today, I think, is also that um, approaching both uh, research but also practical um, development cooperation policies from a transdisciplinary uh, approach is very important, particularly if you want to um, promote a, a water a, a politics of water that is um, basically uh, oriented towards um, promoting the human right to water. And if you take that seriously, I think you have to involve the people that are, that are affected. And that's obviously um, a large variety of, of, of stakeholders, both from civil society, the corporate sector uh, and others. But given the, um, the, the, the challenges of, of increasing water scarcity, um, and given the, the lack of, um, in many countries at least, um, of technical, institutional, financial capacities to, uh, to build up water systems um, that we are privileged to have in, in, in Europe um, and other countries of the OECD world, I think it is very important to, um, to involve stakeholders, not only because uh, they have a right to be consulted, but also because I think it is very important to um, to kind of to, to promote that sense of, um, of community um, and of common interest that is so important in, in managing public issues. And that in many countries of the global south is lacking simply because uh, the government and the state at large um, has, has not been uh, effective um, in, in promoting the common interest. So I think the, um, the city of Vienna and, and Wolfgang's um, inputs have shown that obviously after a very long time uh, involving lots of political uh, conflicts and battles, um, coming up with that kind of legal and institutional framework um, has been a key success factor in, in, in setting up uh, a very efficient and reliable water system. Um, so I'm not, I'm not suggesting that uh, such a system can be built up easily everywhere, but I think that um, a first step is to go forward and involve um, the people that are affected um, in, in, the t in, 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 in deciding how uh, water is managed um, and uh, and used. So I take uh, that's a major takeaway from for me from this discussion uh, today. So I thank all um, for all of you uh, for your for your inputs and for your very active participation in our discussion. And um, um, well, I look forward to uh, discussing uh, yeah. water related issues also with you yeah, uh, and others in the future. So very uh, thank you very much um, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you, everyone.